All right. Hey, folks. So I've been wanting to discuss minimalism. There's been a few videos recently with some real good takes on minimalism, and I wanted to give you my perspective. So firstly, just to get it out of the way, <laughs> minimalism sucks. I don't like it. Not a big fan, but maybe not for the reasons that you think, and maybe not for the reasons which have already been stated. I think the biggest problem with minimalism is that it's marrying yourself to one particular facet of training rather than marrying yourself to results, doing what it takes to get results. And if you're focused on results, you're probably going to cycle through higher volumes and lower volumes and everything in between during the course of your training career. And that's what somebody who's interested in results does rather than somebody who's just interested in being right or siding with some sort of ideology. So I want to take you through what my perspective is and how I deal with my clients. So let's, let's crack on. So firstly, a bit of a historical perspective. I think mainstream bodybuilding has pretty much always been relatively high volume, even dating back to the fifties. I remember seeing a study on the bodybuilders from the fifties. Weirdly enough, it included Sean Connery, the actor. You can find that if you just Google it, but basically they were doing what was considered to be a reasonable amount of volume for the time. Now, minimalistic approaches have always held a small place and they've always tended to reflect the bigger volume of the day. So back in the fifties, when you had guys like Park and whoever else doing what we would now consider to be fairly moderate volume routines, the minimalistic routines at the time were super low volume. I remember seeing some by a guy called JC Highs, who was really famous for doing the 20 rep squat routine. And he had people doing a dip, a chin, and then a set of breathing squats. That's it. That was your workout. And you were instructed to do that probably twice a week. So minimal reflects what is considered to be mainstream at the time. What we consider to be high volume at the time, it's always reflected by an even lesser amount of low volume training. So I think most people would look at Reg Park's routine and probably think, actually, that's not high, what I consider to be high volume. And you're right. But bear in mind, it's all about what was appropriate during the day. At the time when Park was around, we hadn't really explored the super high volume routines, like the 45 set approaches that we have now. So minimalistic routines back then were super low. And what was considered to be high volume was what we now consider to be fairly moderate. But regardless, the point stands, most mainstream bodybuilding approaches really don't tend to be low volume. But equally, most mainstream bodybuilding approaches don't really talk about being high volume either. They just say, this is the way it is, okay? And I think the key issue with that is, the key point to remember is minimalistic routines, they always define themselves by what the high volume or mainstream bodybuilding approaches say. So a minimalistic routine will always start off by saying, we are minimalistic, we are low volume, more so than this, which is the current mainstream. So it's, all, it's, a, weird, it's a weird relationship because the minimalistic approach is almost defined not by itself, but is defined by what is considered to be normal, which is weird, but uh, it's an odd kind of, almost parasocial relationship. For the purpose of this discussion, I want to quantify just the terms we're going to use. So I would say for the purpose of this discussion, so we all are on the same page based on your current 2022 standards, I would say higher volumes is something like 12 to 20 plus sets per body part per week. And lower volumes is something like eight or less sets per body part per week. That sort of eight to 12 range is pretty moderate. So for the purpose of the discussion, that's roughly what I'm talking about. There might be a bit of leeway here and there, but don't get hung up on that. Think about the message rather than the exact numbers. And it's important to define these because you take a guy like Jordan Peters, for example, the guy from England. His approach is probably more, it's probably more identified by being a focused on failure approach. We're not, but it's not necessarily minimalistic. In fact, some of Jordan's routines, the volume gets right up there. He just favors train to failure. So he said himself, he can be in the gym for two or three hours a day. Um, 
and per body part, his volume loads get quite high. So it's important to just clarify what we're talking about. So let's move on. Now, here's how I take a client through the progression. So when I first start with somebody, and let's assume I don't know that much about them because there isn't that much training history there. Let's say they've done this and that for a while, but there isn't any real hard data. They're not a very analytical lifter. What I'll normally do is I'll normally start them with lower volumes. Okay. The problem with starting with higher volumes or moderate volumes is that it's an inevitability. You cannot work long and hard at the same time. That's true for everyone. It's true for me as well. So high volumes will necessitate a bit of pulling back. So the first thing that I want to do with a new client is I want to ensure they are up to speed in how they're performing their sets, performing hard sets. Okay. And part of the solution is going to be performing hard sets. The other part maybe is high volume, but we'll get to that. The first thing we have to rule out is this person actually working hard enough because there are a ton of people out there who are doing ridiculously high amounts of volume and are not really working hard enough for any of those sets to actually make a difference. And you can see them in any commercial gym you go to, just walking around, goofing off, doing a lot of stuff, attending the gym, but not really working hard enough to get results. So the first thing that I want to do is ensure we are focused on hard work. And to that end, a lot of times I start with lower volumes. Yes, I start a client a lot of times with lower volumes. If I'm unsure about their ability to push themselves, I'll start them with lower volumes. The first thing is we give them the chance to work very hard. And what I'm looking for is training either to failure or close to failure ensuring that they have a good rep cadence. So what I mean by that is, are they using a reasonable speed on the eccentric? Are they controlling the eccentric? They're not just like letting it drop. And when they're pushing up, are they making sure they're pushing right the way through the rep? So good, strong, concentric. The next thing is, are we minimizing any momentum or bounce? One of the things that I don't really see is people Dive, bottoms, dive bombing squats to the bottom and then bouncing out of the hole. It's a fine tactic for powerlifting, but for bodybuilding, it's not beneficial at all. It has various ramifications, including making it harder to direct the form where you want it to go, but also just ruining the eccentric. You build a lot of muscle on the eccentric. So I don't want to see that. I don't want to see bouncing off the bottom. Next thing is getting a reasonable range of motion, a good full range of motion. Particular culprits here are leg work. You know, I've seen guys who are advanced in their upper bodies, very strong in their upper bodies, and have absolute twigs for legs. And it's not due to any genetic defect, it's because they don't know how to train legs. And a lot of times, these guys have got knee issues as well, because they've never really trained their joints through a full range of motion. I get them doing full range of motion lifting, again, starting low. So the focus is just on get this set done right never mind about doing four or five sets do one correctly so get the range of motion reasonably well for hypertrophy and finally making sure they're they have consistent intraset rest periods which is something i mentioned on the channel quite a lot standardize how much rest you're taking between your reps too you should be training like a machine back and forth just continuously over and over into a slow inevitable push to failure or close to failure not letting pain hold you back if it hurts, keep going. I need them to have this discipline before we can even think about getting the volume higher. That's why starting with lower volumes is actually very sensible. Now, there is one more reason why starting with lower volumes works well. And that is, if I push them onto higher volumes, it might not be necessary. It might not be necessary yet. So we'll get to that in a moment, but I want to just talk about fleshing out what this initial phase might look like. So initial phase is usually for me, I like to work in blocks, usually four to six weeks. Now, during the course of that four to six weeks, let's say we're doing something like a upper lower. This might be something similar to what we would do. So chest, two sets, a vertical pull for two sets, chest isolation for two sets, 
horizontal pull for two sets, then something for the delts, maybe a couple of exercises for two sets each, then buys and tries a couple of sets each. So what we're looking for in this phase could be, which could involve maybe a top set back off set approach, or it could just be two straight sets, depends. What I'm looking for is excellent technique and form and intensity based on what I said in the previous slide. Okay, all those things. And then what I want to do is I want to monitor the progress of each exercise and each area. And this is really important because what will typically happen is one or two areas will progress fine and they'll just fly. Great. I'm doing here for the chest, this is roughly eight sets per week. For the back, this is about eight sets per week. For delts, this is about eight sets per week. Buys and tries about four direct sets a week. Remember, this is an upper day. It's going to be done twice a week. So some areas will just fly. And if they're flying, great. Leave and be. They're doing well. They're progressing. Other areas won't progress. And that's a tell. See, this is how we start to individualize for the client. So we monitor the progress in different areas. And we see what is lacking, what needs more. We see what is going ahead. That is how you start to be able to tell what the client needs for different areas. How else are we going to individualize? If I just start somebody off on high volume because minimalism sucks, I'm not going to learn these things about the client. Do you, are you starting to see what I'm saying here? It's not about what your system you are adhered to. It's about finding out what's best for you. Next stage, we establish which areas are not making any progress. And firstly, if they're not making any progress, we have to determine there are no negative outcomes. For example, joint pain. So if there's joint pain, they might not be making progress because they're in pain. So then we can change exercises. Perhaps there needs to be a doctor's diagnosis or something like that, but usually it just involves changing exercises. A lot of people don't like squats. They're not very good at squats. Now, while I can teach people how to squat, if somebody's paid me for coaching and they want to result, more often than not, I'm going to say, forget squats, let's go to something else. Something like a machine squat, like a pendulum, hack squat, or maybe a leg press. So the first solution is, the first thing to bear in mind is, it, make sure there are no negative outcomes like joint pain. Okay, If there's that, there's a way of dealing with that. Now, next, if somebody's not progressing and we've ruled out joint pain so they feel fine, they're just not able to add any weight to the bar, then what we do is we add volume. So we add volume to areas which aren't progressing and have no negative outcomes. So over time, what you end up with is some areas which are on the baseline level of volume, other areas which need some more volume, other areas which need even more volume. So all of a sudden we have this lopsided routine where you could look at say the quads and it's like, whoa, minimalistic. And then you could look at the chest and back, it's like, whoa, high volume. That's how you individualize. Do you guys begin to see what I'm talking about? Why a lot of these conversations, like I love the videos which have come out recently. They've been fantastic. I love the big statements. They're great. But when we're speaking to the individual and we're trying to determine what your needs are, I would caution people against splitting off into camps. Okay. Because between you and me, my legs are in the minimalistic camp. <laughs> right? My chest and back are maximalists. My biceps are super maximalists. My biceps <laughs> would have Brad, Sch Brad Schoenfeld himself scratching his head, right? So you have to, I would encourage you to think about what you need. And that, what I've just outlined over the last 10 minutes is the approach that I take with my clients. And that's how I know how to individualize for them. Okay. Bear in mind, I should say at this point, that is assuming they have everything else in order, like sleep, food, et cetera, et cetera, of course. So some concluding thoughts. So minimalism does suck, <laughs> but it doesn't suck because low volume is bad. It sucks because it marries itself to an ideology. And when you're married to an ideology, you can't think outside that. You can't think I might need higher volumes for certain areas. You're just thinking low volume. That's what I'm thinking. I would rather you be married to results. 
Don't be married to an ideology. Marry yourself to results because results is really all that matters. Are you getting a result? Now, I would also say at this point, just to conclude, your body may well be, and it likely is, a lot more nuanced. Different areas will have different volume tolerances. I don't know anyone who is actually a decent bodybuilder who does the same level of volume for everything. All the big guys I'm thinking of in my head, they all have a variety of volume tolerances. They have some areas which need a lot more, some areas which need a lot less. That is what advanced bodybuilding is. And you could argue that's maybe one of the reasons why those people are advanced because they're not married to any one ideology. And the next thing is also, all of this I've said here, these volume tolerances, they will likely change over time. The level of volume I need now is different to what I needed five years ago, to what I needed 10 years ago, to what I needed right at the beginning. In my first year or two of training, I did very minimalistic routines and I grew well. And I grew to the point where a lot of you would be quite happy with where I was at. I had a almost 500 pound deadlift, 350 squat, and about a 200 bench. For a lot of you, that would make you very happy. And that was with fairly minimalistic routines. But the point is, I needed more than that. Now, at the time, the people who I was involved with in that camp, they didn't have the vision to think, let's try and do some more now because you're recovering. All they told me was, in, in their narrow field of vision, they just said, that's it, you've reached your limit. I ventured outside of that box, did higher volumes, and eventually surpassed those numbers and physique greatly. If I had been married to an ideology, I would never have done that. If you stick to your ideology and stick to just one way of doing things all the time, you will fail at some point. You will have to adapt. And this method that I've shown you here is a very simple way of navigating what your body needs. And it's the process that I take with my clients. So that is a very real world example of how to practically find out your own volume tolerances. It's a slow process. And if you're doing it yourself, you have to be very, you have to try and be very objective if you're doing it yourself. If you're doing it with a coach, it's a lot easier. So on that note, if you are not subscribed, go ahead and hit subscribe. That helps out a lot. If you would like help with all this stuff, then there's a contact form in the description. Inquire about my services and we can talk. But hopefully this gives you a thoughtful look at what is the real deal behind volume. So have a great day and I'll speak to you all in the next one.